I'm John Caldera. With me is CU Regent and all-around great person, Heidi Ganahl. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me, John. All right, so we, we've talked a lot over the years, and um, I know people don't understand the regents here in Colorado. We have elected regents. You are an elected regent. Statewide, if that's... Yes. All right, so there's one for every congressional district, uh, and it is still a partisan seat, correct? Yes. I love this because at least you get a sense of who's on the board, at least a tiny sense. Mm -hmm. I know there's a push right now to, to get rid of elected regents. I don't know how they're going to do this, why anybody would want it. Give me your feeling on it. Well, I think there are um, the powers that be want to you know, have a bigger say in higher ed in Colorado and don't necessarily agree with some of the decisions we make, so I think that's why. Comes in. But otherwise, you have bureaucrats or the governor putting in the regents. Like at CSU, the board mm -hmm. is board of directors. And same thing with, I think it's Metro State and others. These are appointed. And so whoever's in power, those are the ones who run the university. Yes, Colorado is one of only four states that elects their board of regents. And it was written into the state constitution. Our constitution's from Michigan. I didn't know that till I became a regent. Really? Yes, and um, so they basically copied the Michigan state constitution. So they elect their regents in Michigan also. And like you said, there's one from each congressional district and then two at large, and I'm one of the at large. And we serve six year terms. We don't get paid, although we do get football tickets and all access parking passes, which is very cool. Can you sell those? <laughs> no, 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 we, we should do that. sell them. That <laughs> right, no, so would not go over well. I, I do want to talk to you about um, particularly political correctness on campus. Mm -hmm. um, let me give you my background real fast, which was, I was a cartoonist, terrible cartoonist. I had a comic strip in the uh, Boulder, da oh, no, excuse me, the, it was the Colorado Daily. And I syndicated it to about 50 papers across the country. It, I wanted to be uh, Trudeau or Burke Breathed from Bloom County. That's what I wanted to do with my life. Um, it didn't work out mostly because I couldn't draw I couldn't spell and I wasn't all that funny. Other than that, I was a really good, really good cartoonist. But I found that was my first real impact with a politically correct movement. That was in the, in the you know, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and every time I got into a paper, I'd get pulled out of a paper because I offended somebody. I was in a liberal arts college someplace and a black trustee didn't understand the term black humor, thought it was racist and had me yanked out. I mean, this stuff was happening all over the time. So the cancel culture of, you can't say that, um, I, th I thought it peaked back then. What does that mean? What does that, what does that know not. mean? It did not. The narrator says, it did it not. Did not. <laughs> it's alive and well. <laughs> is it better? Is it worse? What do you see? Because you spend time there. I had hoped that by this time, whoever my successor is trying to be a conservative or uh, putting out something actually had freedom to speak without being shut down for what he says. It breaks my heart every day. I hear stories from students on both sides of the aisle um, that talk about what happens in the classroom, what happens on campus, what happens at parties. Um, and it's not always the faculty. The faculty get blamed, but it's a lot of times it's the other students and they have kind of this mentality that uh, if you disagree, you need to be shut down, you need to be shouted down, or you need to just be quiet. Uh, there was an article, I, I can't remember which publication, maybe The Atlantic recently, that actually talked about the, can um, the conservative cancel, uh, like quiet culture. So everybody's just quiet. They don't fight back, they don't push back, they're just quiet, and that's what I sense. That, that's heartbreaking, mm -hmm. because the idea of going to college is to be exposed to things you're not exposed to, to have different ideas. Um, so a friend of mine is Ann Coulter. She's a drinking buddy, and she's a lot of fun. I remember years ago, she came to see you and invited me to join her. So we're there in Mackey Auditorium, mm -hmm. and she kept getting shouted down. A lot of people screaming, liar, liar, and so she couldn't talk over them. When she came back a few years later, I think it was a year or two ago, they, they changed tactics. They filled the room full of of, of activists, mm -hmm. and then about 10 minutes into her speech, they all got up and left. So all those seats could not be filled by all the people who wanted to come and see the event. They waited long enough so that the crowd outside would go away, 
and they denied people from seeing her speak. And I'm, I'm trying to think, what happened to good progressives? What happened to good liberals that said, you know, I'll fight to your, my death for your right to say it. Um, right. The ends don't justify the means. I don't see them. What are you seeing? Is there an example you, you have? Well, the best example I can think of is when we uh, hired our new president and we had a forum up at CU Boulder. About eight or 900 people showed up and uh, it was a pretty controversial hire because he happened to have been a congressman or a conservative congressman back in the, the 2000s. That was it. That's the only reason. That, that, was, that was controversy. <laughs> yeah. He was a congressman and he was a Republican. Woman. Yes, yes. And um, the whole place was filled. They were upset angry, really just loud and boisterous. And one of the conservative um, students, uh, she's a senior, got up and said, um, you know, it was a Q&A, got up in front of the whole audience and said, you know what, it's really hard to be a conservative at CU if you can't tell. And the crowd shouted her out, shouted her down, and basically forced her to pretty much leave the auditorium. And she had to have a security person leave with her because she was saying that it was hard to be a conservative on campus. I survived CU Boulder yeah. as a conservative libertarian, and it was, it was hard back then. And I didn't have a thousand people shouting me down. It is really intimidating stuff. And we're teaching our kids, shut the hell up. If you want to get forward, be quiet. I look at what uh, CSU did with their speech code. You, know, uh, you can't say things like this is a cakewalk because somehow that's racist. Don't say America. Don't say America. Yeah. Uh, and people really don't think this stuff is real. Tell oh, me that it's so real. real. It's so real. And um, I mean, the easiest way to avoid addressing it is to say it's not real or that we're making it up, right? But you look at the surveys that are being done, you look at um, um, the drop in admission rates. I mean, why is that happening? Um, a lot of parents, as you go out and r I travel the state because I'm an at-large region and I travel the state and hear parents say to me, I'm scared to death to send my child to one of these universities or college campuses. They might change. They might change their, their transform their value system or the way they believe, you know, and, and how we raise them. And uh, more and more parents are deciding or, or asking their students to make a different choice. So, you know, conservative I'm parents are going to start voting with their dollars, <laughs> their tuition dollars. It's not just the parents. I mean, I think about my daughter who's thinking about college, mm -hmm. and she is really hesitant to even consider CU because we live in Boulder. She knows how unfriendly it is to somebody with her point of view. She wants to get away from that. She wants to go someplace where she feels not threatened. Mm -hmm. And that, it's, they don't think it's real when we say, no, this is real. What, what's news for me, though, is I've always thought it was the faculty. I always thought it was the instructors. You're saying not as much. No, in fact, I think we have some pretty awesome faculty. I mean, the, the thing that does worry me is I think the latest stats are 94% of faculty on campus are left-leaning. And so... A surprise to no one. <laughs> right. And so they're not getting the other side of the story. Even if someone has the right, um, the right attitude, a faculty member wants them to hear both sides, there's still going to be some, you know, some bent one way or the other, depending on what they are. So I'd love to see uh, more diversity of thought, more viewpoint diversity um, in our hiring, in, our, um, in the folks that uh, run the classrooms. But I also think it's on the students to ask good questions and be curious and want to hear the other side of an issue. It's what President Benson said, let's teach our students how to think, not what to think. But students have to be hungry for that and curious and brave enough to speak up and ask for both sides of the, the issue. And that's um, one thing I've been really passionate about the last couple of years is hosting debates. Every semester I try and host one debate on campus um, just so they can hear different perspectives. So last semester we had uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. and Alex Epstein debate oh, the yeah. role of fossil fuels in climate change. Those who don't know, uh, um, Alex Epstein, do I have that name right? Yeah, yeah. Wrote the book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. Yes. A, a important book, yeah. no matter how you feel about the issue, because it's an argument that never gets made. Yeah. Who showed up? 600 people. Really? Yeah. It, who won? Um, I mean, it depended on who you talked to, but everybody walked out with a, an understanding of different perspectives. And I must have 30 people come up to me and say, can you do more of this? This is great. We had Nigel Farage and Vincente Fox debate uh, a couple years ago on socialism or nationalism versus globalism. 
It was great. And we had students that were very left-leaning come up and say, that Nigel guy was kind of cool. I liked what he had to say. I see his point of view. I went there. They had the Conference on World Affairs. It's coming we up in a couple weeks. <sighs> and it was a, co it's a conference of socialistic world affairs. There was no conservatives. And then they decided, well, we'll bring, we'll bring one you know, headliner in so that all the experts that come in for this conference are still a bunch of left-leaning uh, academics and writers, but they'll bring in you know, one, one speaker to, okay. to offset it. It reminds me of the, uh, uh, your Center for Conservative Studies. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I forget the name exactly. And it's good. You guys bring in a, a conservative once a year, and he, he uh, or for We a now year. have two. Oh, two? Yes. Oh, my God, it's a <laughs> movement. I, and it's good. We're making progress. But, little but little. they stay for a year, and then they move on. And mm -hmm. there's two things that drive me nuts. One, you have to fundraise for this. So conservatives who want an alternative voice have to give the center money to go hire an alternative voice because mm -hmm. our tax dollars won't provide it. And it's not a permanent position, it's a visiting fellow. Right. So they're there for a year. And I've asked each and every one, every year we chat with them, and I'll say, so um, what, what's it been like? Are they treating you well? They all say, oh, they treat me great. To which I say, yeah because you're out of here. <laughs> yes. if, you are, if you are in the faculty, if you are in a tenured faculty, they would not treat you so well. Am I wrong? No, I mean, I think it's one good thing that's happening that we have to keep supporting and lifting up. There are amazing speakers that come through there and they're doing the right things, but there's so many other things we need to, to do along with that. And one of those is supporting our conservative students on campus. I mean, there are some great groups out there that you can donate just a few dollars to, show up at their at events, um, you know, help them speak out and be brave and push back against this. That's one of the things we can do. Um, the other thing is, you know, if you're a student, be careful which program you pick and, and... How do you mean? Well, there's a difference between being an engineering student and... Um, a sociology student. Sociology student. student. Yeah, and you're going to get different messaging. Um, or pick, you know, look at the colleges that you're picking. Or, um, you know, just pay attention. It's a lot to put on a kid. Yeah. I, I, I just want there to be some balance, and I want them to feel like they can speak without being canceled, and that speakers can come without being canceled. What's the final answer? Is there something in Colorado that protects people? You guys put out a letter. I'm trying to remember what that was. Give me. Yeah, a letter to incoming freshen, freshmen about how important freedom of expression is and, and free speech, et cetera. We also, um, I worked really hard for a couple years with a couple other regents to change the regent policy and law to get rid of as much as we could safe spaces or free speech zones on campus. And then we went to the legislature. Marcus Vitanus, one of the student leaders uh, at CU Boulder, led that and got the law changed in Colorado. From what to what? Well, it just, um, it doesn't allow college campuses to have like- Speech zones. Yes, yeah, speech zones. Now that still happens. It's just less prevalent. The idea that the regents made a strong point of the whole campus is a free speech zone. You, don't, yeah. you can't bottle them up here. Yeah. And speech is speech, even if we don't like what you're saying. That's right. How do, who fought that? Why was that? I mean, you were like oh, one of the first, it. you were one of the first colleges to do that around the country. Yeah. And I think everybody should go to their alma mater with that letter and say, look what they passed. Yeah. What are you doing at CSU? What are you doing at, at your alma mater? Yeah, it was, it was uh, a fight. It was about, I mean, they, they knew our intention was to support and, um, and uh, help our students have more um, opportunity to be courageous and speak their mind. And I don't know that, you know, that's always the case. They, they uh, <sighs> Some of the folks on campuses would rather just things be chill and one-sided, and that's the way it goes. I mean, even when I, I ran for regent, the chalking that went on on the campuses. Um, chalking. Chalking. It's when they, uh, you can chalk on the campus or write, like, campaign slogans, et on, on the sidewalk. Yeah. It got disparaged, and um, the other sides didn't. And um, same thing happened with some conservative kids who ran for um, student body government at CU Boulder. It's just, why does it only happen to our side? Or when the free speech wall got built at University of Denver and it got vandalized. 
ironically enough. Free speech wall? Yes, there was a free speech wall. What is a free speech wall? Where you can write your opinions and, and say what you want. Yeah. And it got vandalized? It got vandalized, yeah. All right. I live in Boulder. Mm -hmm. You've lived there before. You've now gone to Safer Pastures, <laughs> thing, which is understandable. I find Boulder to be the most hateful, bigoted, uninclusive, least diverse community in all of Colorado. And the university just amplifies that. That there are all these flowery words about inclusion, but if, if, you're, if you're a conservative, you're not wanted, and it's very clear. If you're a gun owner, you're not wanted. If you uh, have a different take on climate change, you are not wanted. If you want to open a charter school. <laughs> if you want to open up a charter school yeah. that has a classical, uh, you can't do it. An arts charter school gets through, the other one doesn't. 700 it, kids signed up for that school and we could not get it through. It was heartbreaking. And there's, there are families all over the Stop County. there, because folks might not be able following you. That, yeah. that Golden, Glue, Golden View Classical, and there's another one in Doug, Doug Co have a model that is called a classical model mm -hmm. for charter school. They study, guess what? The classics, mm -hmm. classic books and, and yeah. Greek and Homer. Music and art. Right. And, and it's so popular that people in Boulder ship their kids if they're lucky enough to get down to Golden. Mm -hmm. Golden has as many people on waiting list as they have in the school. They went to Boulder Valley School District to open up their, their, their school. They got turned down even though there were Nearly a thousand parents going, I will send my kid to the school. Let us there. But no, because well, they like the, the viewpoint. One of the top performing schools in the whole state is Liberty Commons, run by Bob Schaefer, our previous congressman, and uh, top, I think, top SAT scores in the, in the state. In the whole state. Yeah, and Golden View's on its way. I mean, some of the top schools, at one point, I think four out of ten were classical schools. And Boulder was not having any of that. And it, uh, I mean, it, it was really upsetting. It's heartbreaking, mm -hmm. and it's real. Um, before we go, let me ask you a couple quick questions about um, uh, your new your new um, hire. Mm -hmm. So you've got Mark Kennedy, who yep. is the now the president. People say we should know who everyone on that list was. So the Boulder Daily Camera, I believe, and others are suing to find out who applied for this job. Um, that's going to, if they're successful, it's going to change the dynamics of hiring yeah. throughout higher ed in all sorts of ways. Why didn't you disclose who applied for this, this job? You got lots of people who are interested. We never have disclosed that in the process when we've hired the other presidents. CSU didn't disclose theirs when they went through the process. It's pretty much, I mean, it's a norm not to do that because the best people that you're going to approach are already employed. And if their employer finds out that they're looking for another job, usually it doesn't go very well. And so um, somebody leaked the, the list um, and sent Who it to a reporter. The list? Well, there were only very few people that had access to the memo. Who had access to the memo? <laughs> um, I don't know offhand Regents, specifically, but yes, yes. Regents, and I'm assuming, was there an outside hiring firm that, uh, that helped with this? Yes. Was a leak over there? No. I so can't imagine. It was in here. Yeah. And it was because this guy was a Republican congressman. Mm -hmm. That's my Play. guess. Yeah, it's been unfortunate. And um, I think, you know, we've all kind of moved on from it and tried to put it behind us. The, the lawsuit's still going on with the Daily Camera. And they're trying to change going forward how we can hire um, presidents at our universities and college campuses, which is, re I mean, the recruiting firm told us you're going to get a much smaller pool of applicants if you have three or five finalists that you put out to the public and vet publicly because, like I said, who wants to do that if you're employed in a, a place, you know, that would be upset if you were going to apply somewhere else. And when you boil it down to three, four, five, and you let the public know, then the lobbying starts. Yeah. Then the attacks start. Um, then it becomes a political issue, not a hiring issue uh, from the board. The analogy is if you're on a city council, mm -hmm. or I was on the RTD board, and you're buy, buying hiring a new city manager, a new uh, executive director, you have interviews, you put together a group, you go through, and then you announce it. Yeah. Um, you don't, you don't bring it to a public vote because that's what you're elected to do. 
Well, John, I mean, the whole process, so I was co-chair of the search committee with Irene um, Griego, one of the other regents, a Democrat regent, and we didn't have to do that. We decided to make it bipartisan and, and do co-chairs. Um, we had a 17-member search committee that was made up of alumni, community members, faculty, which was agreed on jointly, the whole region board agreed on who was going to be on the search committee, very bipartisan, very diverse. Um, we did town halls, Irene and I did town halls all over the state, listening to people about what they wanted to see as attributes in our next president. And um, we vetted the process, we went through and made sure we, we still agreed that that should be the process for hiring. Everybody weighed in, everybody was kumbaya about it went through the process, the search committee came up with six candidates out of 180 that they forwarded to the regent board. And um, the board of regents interviewed and selected the one finalist, which was Mark Kennedy. So reviewed all of them and selected one. Yeah. So this, the high, the, the six uh, people who um, the regent board interviewed were selected by a 17 member search committee that was very diverse, very bipartisan. How many how many people did applied? Uh, I think about 180. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Did my application get lost in the mail? Because I didn't hear a thing <laughs> from you guys. Time. Next time. Next time. Okay. The it came down. The original vote wasn't it unanimous? Yes, it was 9-0. Everybody was so excited. We agreed that he was by far the best candidate. And then there's a 14-day period where. It goes public, and they, he travels the state and meets with stakeholders and does these forums, and uh, yeah. But was he hired at that point? No, not till the 14 days is up. Why and is there a 14? I'm, I'm, I'm confused. Why is there a 14 day waiting period? Yeah, I think it's in the it's in Colorado law that really? that has to happen. Yeah, I'm that's pretty sure. That, that's for people to yell and scream that it was the wrong yes. the wrong thing. Yes. Are you happy with him? Yes, he's doing a very good job, and. Uh, um, I think the, leg the legislators that I've met with on both sides are very happy with him. Um, he's doing a great job of building a strategic plan and vision for the future, which is, was his first task to accomplish. He's bringing the region board together and having us work together on issues differently than we have before. And it's, you know, don't believe everything you read in the headlines. We're actually doing a lot of good work. Um, uh, Jack Kroll and I just got uh, just addressed um, uh, application fees for veterans in Colorado. Um, Regent um, Smith and I are working on a sustainability initiative. I don't know if you've seen what Rick George has done at the stadium with like the, the really cool aluminum cups. All oh, right, I've heard about ways it. Ways that we can. Um, oh wait, wait a second. Now, when I went to there, we used to have the solo cup fights. Oh yeah, that was so. Fun. Right. <laughs> for if you didn't see this, so in the kids section where you didn't sit down. About a quarter into the game, it turned into this melee of people throwing their beer cups yes, at each other. Yes, I remember. And it was just, and it, or and it oranges if we wanted to go to the orange or bowl. The or and it didn't stop until the end of the game. And that was it. <laughs> and now you're going to replace them with aluminum cups? They're, they're really cool. They're very light, actually. Uh, they're probably even lighter than a... Can you throw them? I'm not going to say. I'm a region. Oh. I don't do that anymore. Um, talk to me about the cost. Yeah. As I'm getting to the to, to the age where I got to put my kid through college, I, oh my God, I was expensive when I went to school. Yeah. The degree hasn't changed. Everything else in life has gotten cheaper. Airlines have gotten cheaper. Technology has gotten cheaper. Communications have gotten cheaper. College keeps getting more expensive. Why? Well, there's two reasons in my mind. One is that it actually is more expensive to deliver the kind of degrees that most students are gravitating towards, STEM degrees, engineering, um, you know, technology, et cetera. That's one small reason. The bigger an, reason. An econ degree 30 years ago and an econ degree now is basically the same thing, isn't it? Mm, point taken. Your sociology class is the same then as now with a few tweaks. All liberal arts degrees are basically the same and could be delivered online you know, for five grand. It, I don't, I'm waiting for this bubble to burst and it hasn't burst yet because I think we all remember our four year, in my case, you know, seven year, but you know, experience in college. Yeah. You know, the, the time you just wanted to stay at college and it was a great thing and we want our kids to have that, but I don't want kids to go into a hundred grand worth of debt for, for an American, uh, um, women's studies class. 
Well, I mean, part of the problem is that um, the state used to fund the majority of our tuition. So it's the formula is flipped. So now we're responsible for paying the majority of tuition. The state pays in Colorado very, very little of it. Um, it funds about eight or nine percent of our budget, and we have a five billion dollar budget. So um, that's happened. The other thing that happened was the federal government got involved, and it started, you know, managing the student loans. And if a college knows that there's a certain amount available to charge for the degree, what happens? You know, you take the incentive to compete and be very lean and mean out of it. Um, another thing is the administrative bloat. We now have. Yeah, talk to me about this one. <laughs> It's a little, it just doesn't sit right with me. Um, we are spending so much on administrators now in, educate, in higher education. I, I mean, the faculty should be really worried about this because they're making a lot of the decisions that the faculty used to get together and make, right? Well, the difference between faculty and staff is what? Or I'm assuming faculty, you're talking about the professors, the teachers, yeah, the guys. The are, teachers, the researchers, right. front lines. You know. and, and just like in K through 12, we keep thinking that we're going to get more teachers when in fact we get more administrators mm -hmm. while the amount of teachers per group of students has remained the same over the last decade we've got growth of like 60 percent in administrative staff right who are these people and what are they doing well think about all the federal regulations that have been put in place in the last 10 20 years and think about um how important it is to you know always be protecting everything that's going on at the university. And, and so it's just, um, it's unfortunate. I'd love to see the money go straight into the classrooms and overall to reduce the cost of college. Um, I think that we can do better there. CU is actually pretty efficient. President Benson did a good job and I think um, President Kennedy will continue to do that of keeping an eye on that. But we can still do a lot of work there and drive the cost down that way. You know, if you want to send your child to college and have it be somewhat affordable, make sure that they have a good idea of what they want to do so they're not switching degrees a lot. Make sure they get as many AP and concurrent enrollment classes in high school as they possibly can. Um, make sure that they go to a college that um, is affordable and that, um, I mean, housing <coughs> can burst the bubble right there. Well, right? That's not CU Both. then. Yeah. CU is not a, CU is... Or Denver. Right. Yeah. It's expensive to live in these communities. And then finally, um, make sure you graduate on time. Only, I think... No, 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 no. Never. Never do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried to stretch Wait that out as long as I child. possibly could. <laughs> well, do you know what they've done now is shifted to talking about six-year graduation rates. You're kidding me. No. And so when you, You're kidding when you me. hear graduation rates, ask them how many years. <laughs> I think nationally, it's like in the 40s for four-year graduation rates. You're kidding 40%, me. 40%, 45% maybe. Um, so that's something to keep an eye on too. But really, it's about having a pretty good idea of what you want to do when you head into Do you ever college. think that online education is actually going to replace it? The idea that you, know, you go to CU so you can sit in a lecture hall with 400 other kids listening to a, not the professor, but the professor's assistant give a class. Mm -hmm. You're thinking, wait a second, we could hire the best professor or the best teacher and they could teach multitudes online and then we could have ways to, to do it. When, when does that happen? Well, I think what's going to happen, and it's already starting to happen, and, and luckily President Kennedy's on top of this. He talks about the fourth industrial revolution and how artificial intelligence is going to dramatically change and disrupt everything. Um, so we're going to go more towards experiential learning, adaptive learning, where you're actually doing the thing that you're trying to learn about, or you're going out and visiting, you know, communities where what you want to learn about, if you if you want to learn about, you know, architecture, you're actually going out into the field and seeing, you know, how it's done. And then um, I think online is going to play a big role in a reducing the cost, but b um, it's going to um, dramatically change the way that you get a degree and move people to lifelong learning. So you're going to get more certificates, digital badges, certifications. Um, at She Factor, my new company, we're looking at digital badging where the girls can earn a digital badge by doing certain activities, um, watching a video, taking a quiz, and then they can put it on their LinkedIn profile. And then employers eventually will search by badges, not necessarily you know, this much experience, this degree. I mean, Google and Apple and a couple other companies just qu took the requirement for a college degree off of their hiring yeah. process. So 
be That's ready. Well they should. I actually, All right, so I've, I've, I've got an idea. Yeah. You're, you're an entrepreneur. You make these things happen. So I'm going to give you the idea. You go you can become <laughs> okay. wealthy on this. Here's what I really think the the issue is: is that we do romanticize the college experience. Oh, yeah. Going to the game, going to the student union, going to the parties, fraternities, the fraternity, sororities. right? All the stuff that that makes the college experience. I, I I look back at my college years. You ever notice that? In the mental files that you have, that is your life, your past, you know, the, the college files, I mean, they're just stacked rows and rows of file cabinets. And then from college to t today, all fits in like one manila folder. <laughs> you know, you, you just remember all that because yeah. it was new, it was different, it was fun, it was, fun, it was scary. Yeah. You know, it's scary then, it's fun in the in retrospect, it's all wild. And so sitting at home in either your apartment or your mom's house, on a computer getting the class isn't the same. So here's the idea. Yeah, we buy an old campus someplace. We mm -hmm. buy a campus that has all the stuff, the student center, the, the dorms, the this, the that, but it's an online school. So people come to do their online classes. Mm -hmm. So they might be from 100 different universities and some of them might get together for their classes here or their classes there, but they're all being taught for you know, $5,000 on online universities, but they're living together away so they can have the sororities and fraternities and beer parties and the student union and all the rest. So, because that's what we're paying for. It's like for. a camp. Yeah, it's a <laughs> camp. Get away from your parents, learn how to live on your own. Here's a safe place. Here's mm -hmm. the here's a dorm and the food and the cafeteria. But instead of paying gobs in tuition, you're paying a couple thousand because you're doing it online. Yeah, but then you, know, you got to pay to live on the facility and yeah, join the fraternity else. and go to the football games. So yeah, but my guess but that's a good is, idea. yeah, but all right, you're not doing it. I'm bringing it to Shark Tank. <laughs> Those guys are going to do it. I've got my hands full right now. I'll I'll put it on the to do list. On the to do list. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much. This is, this has been great. I, I I'm Thank grateful you. that you're there. I'm grateful that other people are there, and I'm I'm grateful that you're able to speak out because. Regents traditionally don't, you know, because they're, they swim in the university world, not in the taxpayer world, not in the student world. And so I'm grateful. Well, thank you for having me. It's important to talk about this stuff. And it's important to talk to parents and students about how they can do things differently and, and have more success when it comes to speaking out or reducing their tuition or, you know, graduating on time. What do I have to do to get the honorary doctorate. We've talked about this <laughs> year after year after year. You guys make that decision, don't you? Um, yes. We have a committee. I'll, I'll, look, I'll talk to the committee. <laughs> Heidi, thanks a lot. Thank you. Good to see you, Jeff. If you enjoyed that conversation, by all means, click one of these other great programs. We have the best conversations with the most fascinating Coloradans. And subscribe to our channel. Just click down below and hit that little bell button, too. You don't want to miss a single show.